Morning, everyone. Morning. Lovely to see you all. I'm glad I'm in here and not out there. One of our lectionary readings for today is a very familiar story. And it's a story that is told, um, I think, in all the Gospels. And we are going to hear John's version of that story. There are two versions of the stories told in the Gospels. And um, people over time have said, well, it's just the one story, really. It's just that the facts change here and there. I don't believe that's right. I think there are two stories and they, have, they happened at different times and they had different outcomes. And it's the story of the feeding of the five or the four thousand. And um, the story where 12 baskets were left over in one and seven baskets left over in another. And the reason I think they are different stories is because the words used for those baskets are different. One was a lunchbox size, the other was a man-sized hamper. You know, kind of the kind of th stretcher size that you might have carried somebody in. They were different stories, different amounts of food that was left over. One story speaks of enough for the day, and the other speaks of God's ample, overflowing, generous provision. Telling of this story is by John. And we know enough, I think, of John's different style of writing to know that when John tells us something, actually, he is seeing depth. He's had years to think about these events that happened when he was with Jesus. The other gospel writers tend to want to tell us the story in order. John doesn't care about order. He just wants us to see the significance. And so sometimes he shifts the order around a bit in order to really shine the light on something. He wants to reveal who Jesus is and the deeper truths. So I'm going to read the story, the familiar story from John 6, the first ver 13 verses, and it will be on the screen. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And then in one of the asides that we only get in John, you have to imagine John going to us. He only did this to test him, for he already knew what he had in mind to do. And Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. Women and children obviously didn't count, or were not counted. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. This story, the feeding of the 5,000, is one of John's seven signs. If you know anything about John, you'll know that he had seven signs that pointed to Jesus being who he said he was. And the sign before it is the healing at the pool of Bethesda. And the sign after it is Jesus walking on the water. go on a tangent right there. Healing at the pool, the Lord of restoration. Great theme for a healing service, don't you think? The walking on water, the Lord who comes to his people when they are in need. 
another great theme for a healing service. But I'm not going with either of those. Not for today. John gives us a snippet in this, his version of the story that we get in general, in the other stories we don't get specifically like we get it in this one. The other versions include the same conversation, but it is not spoken to a specific someone like it is in John's version. And that difference is that the question Jesus asked was attributed to Philip. The question was directed to Philip. In the other versions of the story, Jesus just kind of offers it out there and um, somebody might answer, somebody might not. But in this version, Jesus speaks to Philip. Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And John says, Jesus asked this to test him. He already knew what he was going to do. So you could be sitting there thinking, well, that's a bit mean then, isn't it? Why ask Philip if you know what you're going to do? Why not just do it? Philip's not one of the most prominent disciples in the group. In fact, he's mentioned several times, mostly by John, actually. But we don't know much about him. And we don't know why Jesus tested him or chose to test him in this particular way. But I think it tells us something about Jesus doesn't throw out lessons for everybody. He gives us the lesson that each one of us specifically needs to learn. They're tailor-made. What we do know is that Philip was picked out by Jesus right at the very beginning, and he um, specifically called Philip, says, follow me. We also know that Philip came from Bethsaida, a bit like Andrew and Simon, probably a fisherman like they were. But Philip has a slight difference. He's a Jewish man, but he has a Greek name, which is a bit unusual for that time and place. He has a Greek name, which means... Anybody know what Philip means? Lover of horses. (laughs) I don't suppose you'd have guessed that, would you? (laughs) Lover of horses. And he's not part of the inner core of the the disciples that were closest to Jesus. But he's one of the 12, and he later gets known as um, Philip the Apostle. Not Philip the Evangelist. Don't get muddled up with him. He comes later. Philip the Apostle. And later in John, we learn that actually um, Philip's Greek heritage gives people access to Jesus who wouldn't otherwise have been able to get close. They seem to seek Philip out, and Philip gets them... um, entrance, as it were, into the company of Jesus. But that's only something to do with Philip's character and his heritage. We get another insight in this story that um, I think is quite an interesting one. Jesus said, where will we get bread for this crowd to eat? And he's no sooner said it than Philip, an analyst on the quiet, I think, has done the sums. He's calculated the size of the crowd, which is quite a feat in itself. He's worked out how many loaves will feed a family. He's done the sums. He's multiplied that number of loaves by their price. And then he's divided it by the average salary. (laughs) That's quite something, isn't it? And the days of labor required to earn that sum. He's a walking calculator, this man isn't he? (laughs) Philip the analyst. And his reply, eight months wages, wouldn't buy enough bread for this lot to have just a bite each. On the face of it, it was a sensible question to ask of Philip because it was local to the area. Philip would have known all the bread shops. (coughs) But that's not the point of the question. And neither did Philip answer the question. Jesus says, where? And and Philip answers a different question, how will we buy? That's the question Philip answers. Jesus says, where will we get bread? He doesn't answer that question. 
He answers the how will we have in, where will we get the money from to feed them all? His analysis is factual, but it's flawed. Because I think there is a crucial element missing in his equation. Perhaps he needs new glasses. He needs a new lens in his glasses. Because the element he's missed out is faith. There is no faith. He excludes, Jesus is standing there in front of him, and he totally excludes the possibility of what Jesus might bring to that question. He was asked a question, he analysed it, and he came up with, can't be done. Where will we get enough bread to feed this lot? Can't be done. Quick as that. How many times, I wonder, (laughs) does God ask you to do something and you go, "Mm, can't be done. Sorry, can't be done. (laughs) A few expressions around the room tell me that we've all been in that same boat. And the difficulty for problem solvers is that they, we, I, learn to rely on ourselves too much to solve the problem. And we leave God out, don't we? We leave God out. There was a a story told of um, some shoe manufacturers who were looking to extend their, um, their market, their reach. And they sent two people to a remote region of the world, and um, they sent them to different parts and said, go and see what the possibilities are for selling shoes in that area. And one of them sent back a telegram that said, situation hopeless, no one wears shoes. And the other one sent back a, a telegram that said, glorious opportunity, No one wears shoes. (laughs) It's all in the perception, isn't it? It's all in the perception. If the lens of faith was added to Philip's analysis, I wonder what would have been produced. Philip sees limitations. Jesus sees the infinitely possible. Philip looks at the problem, Jesus looks at Father, and they see different things. Now, if I were in Philip's shoes and that question came to me, it's a bit of an uncomfortable squirm as to how I might have responded. Quite likely no better than he did. (laughs) How about you? How might you have responded? Sorry? And tell me what you want me to do. Might have been a, a good answer, mightn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Lord. You tell me and I'll do it. And the lenses that we have in life, that we accumulate through life sometimes. I think it reminds me of going to the opticians. I, need, I think I need some new glasses. And um, you go to the opticians, don't they? They they put that contraption on your nose and um, they put those different things in and say, is that clearer or that clearer? And actually, I'm not sure. (laughs) It's so hard to tell, isn't it? And then I come away thinking, perhaps I've got it all wrong. I don't know. Anyway, um, but we can pick up lenses in life, lenses of hopelessness, lenses of despair, the lens of grief. The lens of anger, it's everyone else's fault, not mine. The lens of I'm the victim. The lens of it can't be done. Have you got lenses that you see these things through that become an immediate default to a response to that kind of question? And so you come up with, ah, God hasn't answered that prayer so far. Why is he going to answer it now? Can't be done. It's not going to happen. Sickness, that's another lens that we... that can obscure our sight. But put the lens of faith in and what might we see differently? The lens of faith, I think, brings 
opportunities and possibilities. Philip, you know, could have gone into the... Why did he ask me that? Why me? What about all of them? Why me? Why did he pick on me? Why do you think I would be able to know the answer? Why did he think I would conjure up the money? Why, 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 why? And it makes it all about him. And all Jesus wanted to do was show the possibilities of what Father could do. Why do we make it all about ourselves so often? God calls us to be disciples, to be learners. And he calls us to grow. And that is painful and challenging and stretching and uncomfortable. And it's our responsibility how we respond. We could just simply go, ouch. Okay, that cut a bit deep. What did I miss? What did I not see? The why me response takes us nowhere. The what did I not see is an opportunity for growth. So what does the Lord want you to see today? What lens does he want to change in your glasses and replace it with the lens of faith? I wonder.